West Fodringham goalkeeper, Sheffield United. Courtney Sweetman Kirk, Sheffield United forward. Ryan Brewster, Sheffield United forward. Uh, Troy Townsend, head of player engagement, kick it out. So, thanks for joining me uh, for Sheffield United's Black History Month discussion. Um, it's going to be a little bit light, but hopefully you'll enjoy and we'll get a lot of insight into who you are as individuals and your thoughts on some of the topics in the game uh, currently. So, if I was to start, we want to learn a little bit about uh, your parentage. If I was to start and say par parental heritage, where's, where's your parental background from and how has it influenced you? Uh, so, my dad's from Barbados, uh, moved over here young. And my mum is from England, Manchester. I think growing up, we didn't have much money, so I never got to go back to Barbados. Um, so I didn't quite get to understand sort of his heritage, but obviously growing up, he'd speak about it and stuff. And obviously I'm aware that it's a big part of who I am. I've got to be honest with you, I don't know how old you are, but I'm a lot older than you and I've <laughs> never been back to my parents. So let's not put that on camera, by the way. <laughs> but, uh, I get cuss on a regular occurrence, Courtney. And yes, yeah, same for me in terms of Barbados on the dad's side. So my nanny is from Barbados. My granddad is white from, he was originally from Southampton. Mum's from Leicester. So it's quite a mixed bag as well, because on that side, sort of my granddad had a previous marriage. So there's sort of, my dad has two white half sisters and he's also got two brothers. So yeah, it's sort of a, a mixed match in that sense. Um, but again, was and still I'm very close to my nanny growing up and it was you know in terms of cooking with her and, and all that sort of stuff um, and I think it was always an important part of, of my background and for me knowing where I came from. Have you been to Barbados? Unfortunately not. Okay so all in the same boat at the it's moment. It's on the bucket list. <laughs> It's expensive now, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you told Listen. me though, I can't go back to Sandy Lane, she was like, that's where all the posh people go, you can't go down there. It's expensive now. This might be a lot of editing, guys, I'm really sorry. Uh, yeah, um, father's from Barbados and uh, my mum's from Cyprus, um, the Turkish side. Um, yeah, I ain't been back either, don't worry, guys. <laughs> I ain't been back to Barbados, but um, yeah, I've been back to Cyprus quite a bit, but I haven't been back in uh, a long time. Um, yeah, and I, I want to go back to Barbados, um, maybe hopefully next year, but we'll, we'll see. How has, in terms of who you are as individuals, how has culturally the side of, you know, your Bayesian side, how has that kind of impacted on you growing up and, you know, in a positive way? Um, you spoke about cooking their courts and, you know, making sure that you, you understood the Bayesian way <laughs> as such. How has it impacted just in your upbringing as, as, as young young people? I think for me it's, as you say, it's the little bits and bobs, it's the cooking, it's the family gatherings, it's trying to to learn and it is a process because I think some people expect that it's just given and you should know how to be and then it's hard because sometimes you're too white for some rooms mm. and you're too black for other rooms so mm. it's trying to find yourself with um, within that space but for me I've always seen it as a positive thing and, and for me whether it's in life or, or just for me personally, sort of the more that I can draw from, I think is a positive thing. Um, but yeah, you've definitely, it's a process of, of finding your place within where you sit, I suppose. And I suppose for the purpose of this then, sorry to jump in guys, but you've just said something really massively important for me there. You're too white or you're too black. How has that affected you at all? How does that leave you? I think it's, it's, it's difficult because as, you, as I've said, in terms of some people say, well, you can't act like that because you're not black. But then it's like white people are like, well, you're not white, so you can't have that opinion or think in that way. And I think like for mixed people, there's always an automatic thing is like you're labelled as, as a certain thing. Mm -hmm. Where is it? Life in general is a spectrum, isn't it? So I think there is that effect of thinking in, in certain places or certain situations, I can't act in a certain way mm. or, you know, say certain things. So I think in, in that sense, it's probably difficult in terms of watching your P's and Q's and yeah, how I am with my nanny and her side of the family. And, and my dad is probably, you know, different from, not necessarily my mum, because we're very close, but maybe that side of the family, it's a, it's a very different relationship, I would say. Yeah, what about you, Wes? Yeah, I think uh, it's an important point, because I'd say when I was young, to the majority of, say, white people I'd interact with, that instantly say you're black. And to black people, they'd say you're mixed race. Mm. So it was like kind of a weird space. And I grew up living the majority of my childhood with my dad. So I was predominantly in a black household. 
so I felt naturally yeah. more black, mm -hmm. I would say, because that was sort of all I knew. Majority of my friends were black, even though I lived in West London, more cultural area. Um, the majority of my friends were black, but then there'll be times you'd have instances, say, like you do in your young girl, instances with police or whatever, like messing about, and instantly on the radio it's black, and you'd think, well, then you get the phone for the doctor, say, and you're writing down, well, am I writing black Caribbean, am I a mix, do you know what I mean? You don't quite really know what to write, so um, I think you just go for a process growing up, sort of finding out who you are, and, and yeah, it's, it's, it's quite a difficult place to be. Is there any way that you can explain how difficult that process is? Because it's, it's about your identity, yeah. isn't it? And your identity is being pulled from pillar to post yeah. to the point where you're even not sure. Yeah, yeah, you start questioning, that's the thing. I just say it's wherever you feel comfortable. Do you know what I mean? It's one of those, it's people are born in loads of different countries, um, different colours. I don't think it's on anybody else to put a label on yourself. It's mm. where you feel comfortable. Mm. And, you know, for me, I was like I said, grew up in a black household, but I never neglected my white side of the family or didn't feel like, oh, well, I don't have any white heritage because I do. Um, yeah, but it's like I said, it's a process you have to go through and you do. Yeah, yeah I'd say, um, whereas the same as West, to be honest, where he grew up in a black household, I was a bit probably different because I, I lived with my mum and uh, my mum and dad split up when, when I was younger. So I was more or less with my mum's side more more time than, than my dad's side. So it was a bit different for me, but even even that side, when I used to go to Cyprus, I was <laughs> the little black kid, <laughs> you know you know what I'm saying? It's, it's like, but then I go to the black side and uh. I'm, of course I'm black, but it's like, oh, you're not, I don't know, you're, like they say, mixed race. Uh. So it's, it's, it's a bit of a, a weird one. Um, but um, growing up was, it, it was hard, I'd say, because as well when you go to school, like they were saying, it's, you know, you got you got different types of friends. You got you got black friends, and my my was predominantly um, like I'm Asian. So you have I have quite a few Asian friends and and white friends, and it's like where where do I I fit, fit in, in yeah. kind of thing? Because you did you had the black friends which are probably darker than me, and then you got the lighter friends, and then you're like, so where where am I? And um, yeah, growing up was 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 different. But when when you don't really care and you just wanna be friends with whoever, yeah. whoever you click with, it makes it easier. Does the shade of your skin matter? As I look at the three of you, does the shade of your skin, is that brought into play at all in terms of, you just mentioned there, you know, darker friends. And I have this particular thing at the moment around opportunities. If you're lighter skinned, you're deemed kind of okay. You're all right, you'll get the opportunity. If you're darker skinned, there's a struggle still. Is, is that reflective at all? Do you see that at all? Is, does it matter? Or has it mattered in your journeys? I don't think it's personally mattered to me, but I think the obvious thing is in society, it, it, it still does matter. <laughs> and I think it's different for different people and, and the lighter skin that you are, I do think it's easier in terms of those opportunities. But for me personally, it doesn't matter. And I suppose if you are black mixed race, you always have that automatic thing of, of looking at other people in a different way in terms of you are more, I won't, I won't say forgiving, that's not the word, but when mm. you grow up again in a multicultural background. So for me, you know, there was white kids, black kids, mixed race kids, Indian kids. So you get to that stage when you're younger where it's it's one of those cliches that I hate, but you don't see don't it. See, you just yeah. see your friends. Whereas yeah. then when you start to get older and there's different things where, you know, society sort of hardens you, doesn't it? And it, it, it makes you separated, I suppose. So I think there's still a lot, a lot of work to do in that sense. I'm glad the cliche still exists because as mentioned, and I'm, last time I'm gonna mention this, by the way, I'm a lot older than all three of you. <laughs> um, and those cliches <laughs> existed because again, my friendship circle was Asian, white, Greek, Turkish. You know, if you were nice to me, you were my friend and, and we grew up in that way. And football was obviously that connecting kind of thing as well. You just automatically kicked a ball and became friends. Was that very similar for you, Rian, in, mm -hmm. in terms of growing up? What were your first memories of playing football and who that social circle was? Yeah, um, I remember just playing in the playground, you know. Um, we used to do like our, my side of the year versus the other side of the year. And it was, in my year, like my side of the year, there was all different types of races and, you know, we just all loved football. Mm. So we used to just go and take that side of the playground and play one big match and it was... Anyone that liked to play football that was on our side of the year played right, for our team and then the other side and it was not, oh, 
black people all together, yeah, yeah. white people are on the same team. It was just mixed, and that's what I mean. Football, I think football brings that that togetherness no matter what. Um, but I think in other instances, you can you can see uh, it does pull away like the different type of races. Mm. Who used to win? What side on of the, the year? Majority, yeah. Man, come on, man. My side, man. <laughs> I'm just mean? asking, just putting it yeah. out there, just in case. No, no, man. never lost at all. When I weren't there. <laughs> 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 what about you, Wes? Memories of first memories of football playing the game? Um, so my primary school, we used to do the year f so sort of the end of the primary school so mm. it's year five against year six so mm. when I was in year five we'd play the year sixes and I used to play on pitch like Rianne can start laughing now <laughs> <laughs> I used to play on, on pitch but I was good I was the best in my year on pitch so where where did you used to play I don't play anywhere just do it just do it just run about so um, yeah we used to play then and I was an emotional kid like just didn't really have like control of my emotions and when we lo used to lose I'd cry and I'd just go into a lesson, in just cry. I'd cry instantly if we lost. Every time, I'd cry. I'd like, still do that now. No, 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 no
more my dad, because mm. um, my mum was at home with my sister, but my dad used to take me a lot. And then um, I used to get home at 11, 11.30 at night and wake up at 7 in the morning to go to school, half asleep like a <laughs> zombie. But um, yeah, wherever the games were, sometimes yeah. the games were far, they would both get up and take me. I say my dad more, more than my mum when I was younger. Um, but no, they were very, very good to me and I never, never ever went without. I never missed a game, never missed a training session because they couldn't take me. They always made time uh, to take me. Brilliant. Courtney, what about yourself? Yeah, so mum was, was really supportive. So my mum and dad split up when I was really young. Um, but mum didn't drive, um, but always found a way to get me there. And whether it was her, a mixture of then my dad and, as I say, I'm very close to my nanny on my dad's side mm. and, and my granddad. So sort of between the family unit, I think, it, it, you know, I always managed to get there somehow. And then later on, when my um, mum's my partner now, when he came on the scene as well, he drove. So um, that was helpful. And it's quite funny because my nanny, she wanted me to be the next Serena Williams. Yeah. So <laughs> I disappointed her quite a lot with that. So I had a stage where I was playing, uh, playing both football and tennis and it got to a stage where... Um, the the training nights conflicted yeah. and I and I had to make a choice. So she will tell you to this day She's I broke never her forgiven. heart. She's no, never she, I enough. could have been travelling around the world with you doing your laundry. <laughs> So, I mean, she's proud of me now, don't get me wrong. She'll, she'll be cussing me now saying, I am proud of you. But yeah, she would have rather me be a tennis player, but I was tall growing up and then I stopped growing. So I'm, you know, five foot four. So tennis probably wasn't for me. In, in all <laughs> Brilliant. So we've got the nanny story as well about you being a tennis player. I love it. Wes? Uh, yeah, so by the time I started playing football more seriously, my parents had split up, so I was living with my dad. Um, but yeah, he was massively supportive. Um, obviously, we lived in... I played for Fulham, but they used to train in Motswell Park, which is Surrey. Yeah. So it would take us an hour and a half on a train. Again, I wouldn't miss a training session, wouldn't miss a game, even the away games. He'd find a way to get me there. Um, but he was really, really supportive, but really tough as well. At the same time, just old school black man, just mm. no time for like <laughs> messing about, none of that. So I'll tell you a couple of funny stories. So when I would play, and I'd do something wrong, I'd look over and he'd just give me a look. Mm. He wouldn't say anything, just a look. And it just just helped me to focus. Like yeah. it wasn't a look as in you're getting beat so you get in, but yeah. it was a look as you better you better fix up. And I always remember that to this day. And um, whenever I sort of strayed, I used to mess about, be a joker, he'd be on me all the time. Um, and yeah, his influence was just, you know, massive, massive for me. Brilliant. Did you say it used to be a joker? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what? I'm a big man now, I can <laughs> joke. <laughs> Not having that. He's still a joker. <laughs> He's still a joker. So, listen, your upbringing is there. You know, you've, you've all grown up in different areas and you've all experienced different things, although very similar. Um, there's been quite significant people, family support in your lives. Um, you end up playing for Sheffield United. What does it mean to play for this football club? You both look at each other as well. You go first, I'll yeah. go first. Um, no, it, you know, I find that this team is very, very together. No matter what race, colour, age you are, I felt. I think even in the changing room, you know, like everyone's together, and I think it's starting to to show on the pitch mm -hmm. quite a bit. Um, the togetherness, you know, even when we played on the weekend, you know, one person's in there getting, you know, with the other physical with the other team, and then we're all we're all in there because I, it doesn't matter whether Wes Wes is in there, I'll be the first one in there. Whether George is in there or Eags, and we all come from different backgrounds, and I think, um, and it shows, and I think it also shows with the fans, because you know we all, we all have chants and songs, and they all sing it no matter like black, white, mm. Asian, you know, different from a uh, Irish, um, Scottish, and I think that that shows for the the whole statue of the club. So the fans just see you as someone representing their football yeah. club and they want to give you their full backing and support, yeah? 100%. You work hard for them, they yeah. chant your name. <laughs> <laughs> Courtney? Yeah, I think for me, the, the Blades for sure have got a special part in my heart because I came here when I wasn't in a good place with football and it was sort of, I might retire. Okay. And I, was, I, f I fell out of love with the game. And, Why, um, Courtney? Sorry. Uh, so I was at Liverpool 
there was, I'd had a bit of a, a bad time there in terms of it's quite well documented in mm. terms of the stuff that was happening behind the scenes at, at the club there and, and thankfully that's been sort of resolved now but yeah sort of fell out of love with the game um, and yeah wasn't sure and I suppose the women's games are a bit different as well in terms of you know the financial incentives yeah. and everything like that isn't as strong so it's terms of you know what I'm not I felt at that point in time I wasn't getting enough back from the game to not enjoy it mm. and the way it made me feel. But yeah, sort of speaking to the club and, and especially Redders, you know, the gaffer who I'd worked under before, um, sort of persuaded me not to. And, and yeah, forever thankful for him for that because now I'm in a place where I'm at a club where I feel valued. Um, I'm enjoying my football. And it's again, I'll bring out another cliche, but this genuinely does feel like a family club. It's, you know, it, it's quite small in terms of, of, of you know, the, the, the ins and outs of the training ground, but in terms of the stature of mm. the club um, and the fans and the way that you're made to feel within the club, it's that for, for women's football, I suppose there's always um, that, that thing about resources and money, and that's one thing. But in terms of how you're made to feel as a person within the club, like the club have got that right here for sure. You're made to feel a part of the club. And I think that's really important. And yeah, it's the same, you know, with us in terms of the girls, there's, there's a mixture of people from different backgrounds, but that sort of, you know, we just get on with the one with the job and we're all a team and very much in, you know, enjoying each other's company at the moment. One uh, last game out against Durham and hopefully that continues and we have a good season. Fantastic, brilliant. Where's the new? I'd say really welcoming the fans. I'll speak on the fans first. I'd just say, yeah, really, really welcoming. Um, no matter who you are, where you're from, if you work hard enough, you're good enough. Um, and that's the main thing. I can I feel that energy on a match day. Also, seeing on match days, we have boys like Ili from Senegal. You see young kids with the flags. Um, obviously, Sander, Norway, Anel from Bosnia. You see them with the flags and it can help people that are coming from different backgrounds here to know that they feel welcome and supported um, and I think that's a big part. So they're really celebrated? Yeah, yeah they are. Yeah, you yeah. see the flags, it's the first yeah. thing you see. Amazing, amazing. Listen, we have to touch on this issue. It's an open-ended question and I, and I know that I know what your responses are going to be in regards to the question that I asked but I want you to give me a little bit more detail in them if, if you're okay with that. Um, so the question is, is racism still an issue? Um, yeah, me and you have spoken on a number of occasions about this and I suppose it's why I'm going to come to you first. Um, is it still an issue and why, Rian? Yes, and I don't know. I don't know why it's still an issue. It shouldn't be, mm. but it definitely is still a big issue in my eyes. And, you know, we talk about things getting done and I don't think things are getting done. You know, you might get the odd punishment here and there, but I don't think it's, it's severe enough for it to... Uh, for it to stop mm. um, with fans to players to uh, people on the side like staff members on the sideline and I just feel like it's just a big thing in the game and and it hasn't slowed down it's probably stayed the same stops for a little bit and then mm. just carries on talk to me about one of your experiences and how it made you feel well, which one should I? Which Any, one do you want? You, want. you don't have to uh, name the club or name yeah, whatever, uh, but just how it made you feel as well. I talk about probably a player when, uh, yeah, we were, we were winning. This is when I was playing uh, under 19 Champions League. Mm -hmm. um, it was against Sevilla. Yeah, Sevilla. I will name the club. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we were winning. Obviously, game's going well and whatever. I think I scored actually. And uh, I remember just a uh, little something ha happened on the side um, and I was angry. I think I lost the ball or something and I was angry. I just chased him down, left one on him a little bit. And uh, yeah, just on the floor now, we're both on the floor. And I heard something. I thought, what? And, uh, am I is deceiving mm. me or did I? And I said, say that again. And then he said it again. And then, yeah, I just lost my head completely. Um, went to walk off the pitch. Um, at the time, Gerard was the manager, and uh, obviously, I think he realised what had happened because I wouldn't react the way I did mm. if nothing, nothing had happened. And he just said, "Rian, like, do you want, do you want to come off the pitch? If you do, um, I will back you fully. If you want to stay on, I'll back you fully." And um, yeah, he was really good with me. I ended up staying on the pitch. Um, told the ref, whatever, and uh, I'm not gonna say what I said to him. <laughs> um, but yeah, I carried on, won the game. And uh, yeah, uh, I'm not gonna say what I tried to do in the 
in the tunnel. But um, yeah, it got. So you were still angry though, weren't yeah, you? Yeah, I was. You... I was angry for about three days. Mm. And why? What? What is it that makes you? I say, what is it? I don't mean that disrespectfully. But yeah. why are you angry for so long? Because I feel like you could say anything else apart from the colour of my skin. To to like, if you'd have said anything about my mum, of course I'll be angry. But I wouldn't like. I'll just laugh it off because I'll be like, you got to say that to try and get in my head. Mm, mm. Um, you can say anything about pff, anything else. I'm rubbish at football. Mm. I'm, you're, you're terrible, whatever. I don't care. I'll probably just laugh it off. But the fact that you have to go to the colour of my skin and my background just makes me feel like you're just a, a low life. And probably now, like I was very young then, yeah, so I was yeah. very hot-headed. And I've, I think now if someone was to say it, like another player or something, I'd probably just laugh it off because it's happened that many times now, I probably just report it, mm. laugh, and just say, just laugh, and you say, what, you have to, mm. you have to say that to me to try, now I know I'm better than you. Yeah. Which yeah. I probably, I know I'm better than them anyway, but, mm. you know, like, I just feel like, that's, you're trying to put me off my game, when probably you're the one that's off your game anyway, because that's, you got to go that low to, to try to get under my, my skin. Why did you want to walk off then? At that moment, can you remember? Yeah, because I just wanted to smash his face and, <laughs> So you're protecting yourself? Yeah. From doing something that I probably would regret yeah. after. Yeah. So it was about two minutes, so I walked I walked down the, the touchline. Um, Gerard spoke to me, calmed me down a bit, and then I went back on the pitch. It was about a good two minutes, and he calmed me down. And after that, I was still angry, but it was more like, not laughing about it, but mm. I was still... You managed to process yeah, it yeah, almost. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And obviously I reported it, and the ref spoke, and I think the guy got banned but I think it was for something yeah, like free game yeah, or something yeah, like that nothing yeah. major but yeah that's that's one of my experiences okay thanks Rio. whereas yours is a particular case because you're a goalkeeper who's going to hear all the abuse by the way anyway because yeah. you just can't ignore it can you yeah um so is it still an issue and are you hearing some stuff behind you that actually you won't be able to repeat on on, on this platform today uh yeah it is still an issue massive issue um I do think there's been a lot that's tried to be done, um, but equally sometimes I could feel like I feel as though it annoys people, and I don't know why. Mm. It's oh, I'm sick of seeing this now. I'm sick. Oh, the knee. I'm sick of seeing this now. Like coming up, just move on from this. Um, and it's hard. It's hard to try and you know change people's views that don't want to change. Um, but my experience is from in game. This is when I was in Scotland. I think they had player had a shot. Um, it's gone out for a goal kick. I've like jumped over to obviously see it go over. I was sort of hanging on the bar, <laughs> you know where this yeah. one's going. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and I've heard a shout from the crowd, "You black monkey!" Mm. And I was like, "Whoa!" But I wasn't sure. Right. I, I heard it. Yeah. But I wasn't. I was that shocked. I was thinking, surely he's not said That's that. That's what I was going to say to you. What is that instant? I wasn't sure. Because you just said you heard it. Because it was that outrageous that yeah. I thought there's no way he's just shouted that out. Mm. So I thought the game was on Sky as well. Um, so I thought I thought just carry on with the game. Like maybe I've heard wrong. Mm. And then it was it wasn't until after the game that a fan from that team DM'd me on Instagram, oh. apologising because it was the fan that was sat next to him, apologising oh. for him. Basically, for what he said, said he doesn't represent all the fans at this football club. And yeah, if you're affected, like I'm just want to apologise on his behalf. How did that make you feel? Because to be fair, it was whenever I did, you, you never answered yeah. me. So how did you? <laughs> I just wanted to put that out there, by the way. <laughs> That's a lie. You know that one. You didn't make me scroll. You didn't make me Yeah, no, it was it was bit, it was bittersweet, and I say bittersweet because it confirmed what I yeah. thought I heard. Yeah. Um, but so is that reality? Kicking yeah, in yeah, it was reality kicking in, and. But also just the fact that a fan took his time to apologise and make sure I was all right. I thought, you know, that was a touch of class from him. But yeah, just, I've had a few incidents, obviously. Just actually the perfect, oh, I'll choose my words wisely here. For an incident that is that obscene, you've almost had the perfect scenario because of the fan DMing you. Yeah. And apologising, and you know what I mean, yeah, looking yeah. after your welfare, trying yeah, to look yeah, after no, your welfare. Yeah, yeah, no, it was nice. It was honestly, it was really nice. I, I remember DMing back and just saying I appreciate. Mm. Yeah, I'm fine, and and, and I'm thank all the best for the season. I didn't, mm. I didn't. Do you know, what? I was because obviously this wasn't till maybe 
I'd say two days later, I think it was that he messaged me, but mm. I didn't want to report it because I wasn't sure. Yeah. I wasn't, at the time I wasn't sure, so I didn't want to say, oh, I heard this and maybe I didn't. I was sort of questioning myself, but yeah, after I got that message, I just, honestly, I let that one slide. Um, the message did make me feel a lot better, but like mm. I say, it just confirmed what I heard and just the fact that someone can say that so blatantly at a, at a football ground is just terrible, to be honest. Would you report now? If yeah. Yeah. Without question? Without question, I'd report it. Even if you, like, how, you didn't know if you were sure? No, I wasn't sure. If I'm not sure, I'm not going to report it. If I'm not sure, I'm not going to report it. But if I'm sure, I'm certain I heard it, then 100% I'm going to report it. Courtney? There's more to be done. I think I'm going to go off on a bit of a tangent now. Wow, let me put my yeah. iPad away. But you know what it is? I think you look at this Black History Month and it's great for this month, but then where, where does it go? And it's a similar thing with the knee. We had the conversation with the FA, obviously before the start of the season, in terms of it's potentially now just going to be done at, at showpiece times to get maximum exposure. But where do we go with it? When, when we do these things, what's behind it? What's the process? Because going back to sort of education, so for me, it was talking to, to my parents and my family heritage, it was, investing in myself a car or natives what a great book that is yeah. reading books like that and you know then when you look at everything that happened around george floyd and the the colson statues and then you're looking at slavery and the part that the british empire had in that how do children growing up don't don't know that we're taught about henry the eighth and his yeah. wives but we're not taught about everything around it now is that a shame for the british empire and britain that we don't teach that and i think some of it with it's so difficult because so to put yourself in someone else's shoes i grew up in a multicultural background with all different races and, and creeds and, and everything else in between so it's easy for me or i think it's easy for me to to be just a normal person in society in terms of take everyone as they are but if you've grown up with i don't know potentially racist parents or a, and a, a background that's predominantly white Yes, there's an onus on you to educate yourself, but then if then you're going to school and all you're learning about is Henry VIII and not the history of, of the British Empire and why the, the Rimrush generation were invited over and told to come over and why the, these immigrants come into the country, it's, it's difficult, isn't it? So I think there's, there's, from top to bottom, whether it be football, whether it be education, whether it be the government, that obviously needs to change. and. Yes, we can educate ourselves, but we've got to give kids a, a head start in terms of knowing just the background of history. And, and yes, as I say, the month is fantastic because it highlights it, but it needs to be more than a month. It needs to be more than a need. There needs to be a process behind what we do. And in terms of sort of my own background, I say this sort of with a pinch of salt, I may be quite lucky in my complexion in terms of I'm quite light skinned. So we're going so, back to that colorism bit yeah. again, aren't we? Yeah. So we're going back to that colorism and like I say, talking about sort of that, that book I was reading, Natives and Akala in terms of like, that then translates into Jamaica. And if you're seen as light skinned, for example, in Jamaica, then you know, you're seen as a higher class automatically, even though, so he was talking about in his book where he went, he's mixed race, he went to Jamaica and he was like one of the poorest members of society in England, but automatically when he's Jamaica, they think he's rich yeah. because he's light skinned. Yeah. So. Or red, as they used to say. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it's crazy. So for me, I've maybe been lucky in that sense. Um, do, you, do you call it lucky though? Is, are you throwing lucky at me just to, or do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, there's there's been a couple of instances when I was younger, and you know why it upset me because it was sort of to do with my dad as well. So when my dad was watching and. The opposition player had figured out that was my dad, so it was more or less against me. More about your dad. More about my dad, and that upset me, because oh. then I fought for him, and then I've had stories from my nanny as well, like what she had to go through coming over, and being, again, it's funny, she was only talking to about me to this the, um, the other day, in terms of then the, the issues that they had, in terms of her being married to a white man, and mm. then the racism that they received. Um, so yeah, it probably, it was less for me, a more upsetting to think that someone had spoke about my dad and, and my heritage in that way but it's also like the institutional stuff or the things that people say without thinking like oh yeah you're fast because you, your dad's yeah. black mixed race and you know what and you just think mm. it's so lazy i was quick you know I was, no, I was, no why are you laughing no seriously i was <laughs> i was quick 
<laughs> but you yeah. see where Andrews gets. Yeah, from I was gonna say. Yeah. I was gonna but say but that. yeah, it's you. the things like that, and it's even where your teammates. But I like what Wes said about that fan calling the other fan out or sort of apologised on his behalf, and that's such an important thing as well because we go and people say things and we almost brush it under the carpet. And especially, I think it's harder when it's your friends or your teammates because you sort of think. Oh yeah, but I know them as a person, and they're yeah. nice, and maybe they don't mean it. But it's got to be like, mate, you can't, you can't yeah. say things like that. Yeah. Courtney, thank on you. that, yeah. Freak, go on, yeah. I'm not gonna name the name, name the player or name the team or whatever, but that's when you said about the teammate. Um, where's um, not not it's not in our change room, by the way. <laughs> but um, someone that come back from from another team was saying about how a white player. Mm would just joke about and, you know, say, leave a banana on, on, a, on a black player's, like, space or, or say, are you hungry and then offer him a banana or something like that. And I, I feel like if that happened to me, I'd be angry and I would say something. But, you know, the other players would just laugh it off. And for me, that's, that, that's not right. Mm -hmm. And yeah. like you said, it's, it's, your, it's your own teammate. So if your own teammate can do it, then... He's basically saying that the opposition can do it and anyone else could. He's could allowing that, that space yeah. almost for you to be targeted in that way. Exactly. And I feel like that, that shouldn't, especially your own teammate anyway. Let's uh, thank you. Incredible stories, by the way. Um, I'm not shocked by any of them, but I think the more, well, I say the more that we talk about them, the better it will be. But I think you've all highlighted that more needs to be done and it doesn't. Unfortunately, it's not happening at the moment, and maybe it's these voices, the player voices, that need to be heard more. Do you have any solutions? Do you think that why doesn't football try X or why doesn't football try Y? Or do you think that football's not just not strong enough in, in those kind of ideas that it has? So, like you've mentioned, Courtney, taking a knee. We do it, and then we stop it, and there's no... What's next? Yeah. What's the next stage? Is there any solutions at all that any of you can think of? That's, that's the million pound question, isn't it? I think, obviously, having to report it to the referee straight away, ejecting fans from stadiums, lifetime bans, that should be a given. But I really do think it just comes way, way back. Football can only do so much. Yes, as I say, football is a mirror of society. But for me, it needs to go way back. We need to look at the education system, how we're educating our children in schools, because football can only do so much. And it's sort of it's an analogy that is happening in, in women's football as well in terms of you know women's football has done so well in the top two leagues and now it's most things grow organically so they go bottom up whereas the sort of the super league and the championship are then having to filter down yeah. um to the lower pyramids and i think it's the same thing with football in terms of they're trying to do these things with with racism but there's only so much that they can go top down with because it's the rest of society so I think it's very, very difficult to, for, for it all to lean on football. But I think things like this, or just in general, opening channels of communication for people to speak, having those processes, and just, I think sometimes it's just a lack of understanding, mm. or as I say, a lack of education, and sometimes it's just laziness. Absolutely. Anything to add? I think we that? say like there's a problem with racism in football, but the reality is there's a problem with racism in this country in general. Um, it's not just football. But there'll be some that say that you're talking rubbish. Racism there will doesn't be, exist. But, but it does. That's their opinion. Clearly, mm. it does. I've had many in our county, yeah. so probably you guys have it too. It's one of those where... <laughs> is anyone born racist? They're not. So it's learnt behaviour. So where does that lead to? It leads to the parents, it leads to their surroundings, um, how they grow up. It's difficult because if you go to certain you know, areas in the country, there might not be any black people there. And in time they see a black person on the TV, so if they've not grown up having any interaction with a black person, how are they supposed to react? What kind of stuff are their parents saying to them? How does that kid get the, you know, the education or that they need? Um, it's difficult. And it's specifically in football, um, when we're talking about instances, say, with the crowd or you know, with players on players or whatever, the first thing they do is they go to your pocket, they hit you with a fine. And when you're getting fines more for betting than racism or the branding on your, your boxers, is the fines more than mm. fine for racism? What kind of message are we sending out there? What are we saying? How important is racism then? We're not, we're not, you know, valuing it very highly at the moment. I don't think. Okay. Anything else? I know you're right with that. Yeah, I've said it plenty of times. I've had interviews with you, and 
you just got to... Me, I would ban them, but, but not ban them for three games. Ban them for six months, a year. Because trust me, I, I can't play without football for a week. Mm. So you, you ban them for six months, a year, they're going to be struggling. And that will hurt them more than giving them a little fan or ban them for three games because more likely than do it again. They say, oh, I'll take another ban for, for another three games or something. So, yeah, the, the punishment should be more severe, but I don't think... Don't think it will be, because, yeah, I just think, nah. Maybe yeah, it's it not in the best interest yeah. of the sport. Yeah, yeah. We've, you've all touched on young people. We're coming to an end now, but we've all, you've all touched on young people, really, and said how much education is required. Is that where we're going, then, for the future? Is if we do things properly now, then our future will have a better kind of outlook in regards to this conversation, in regards to the black experience, in regards to people understanding you know, that we're all as one, because when you were children, your demographic around you was amazing. So couldn't it be like that for the future? It's difficult. It's difficult because, like I say, we were fortunate in the fact that maybe we grew up in places where there were loads of different backgrounds. You, you get to know, you're aware of it. But there's some parts of the country where it's not like that. Mm. So how do they get the education? Do you know what I mean? How do they understand that, you know, well, actually, come away from your town, there's a whole group of other people out there um, that are human just like you and you know don't deserve to be looked at differently um, it has to start from the ground up so you've got to start you know whether that's going into schools which I know a lot of that stuff gets done um, but yeah like you say the Black History Month is one month out of the year can we not filter all these sort of messages in throughout the whole year and just constant reminders constant different little things workshops whatever it is to try and get um, tap into the kids heads especially the ones that are not in a multicultural yeah. environment where they live um, and yeah just just keep on at it I was gonna I wanted to end on a positive and then I'm gonna ask you is the Black History Month significant for you hoping that you may be positive is it significant for you no why not because I thought like, like we said it's one month out of uh, 12 and what so as soon as it the next month comes it's like everyone forgets so yeah, it's just one month. It's not really enough. Like we said, why can't you filter it through the whole year? Mm. And not we're not saying bombard everyone with yeah. Black History Month for twelve months, but it's you know filtering here and there and just reminders of of stuff like that. So one month out of twelve, yeah, not enough. Not enough for me. Courtney. Yeah, I feel like some you know, whoever it be that, that takes on the stuff for Black History Month, it's almost at times like a tick box exercise. It's like, yeah, it's October, we've done our bit, tick that off and, and forgotten again. So, yeah, you know, we, we know we do all these sort of works and companies, football clubs do it within the cities and target, you know, socioeconomic in that sense. But like Wes says, can't we then look at targeting different areas, different demographics, different backgrounds? So then we can, you know, go into these places, go into schools, go into... You know, maybe football clubs in those areas that aren't as diverse as we used to and, and use education as a tool because, you know, children, they don't know any different. Like, mm. they honestly don't know any different growing up. So if we can then create this from the bottom-up society at the moment, hopefully it then filter through and create more people in a football stadium that will call it out and go, actually, I'm really sorry, Wes, that, that wasn't right. They will then start calling their friends, their family out in different situations and that's how we get change and you know it's it's very idealistic I would say at the moment but I think that's the way that it's got to go. Brilliant. Any final thoughts from you Wes? Um, no. Oh. Do you know what I was going to say is that there was a new Prime Minister announced maybe we need to look at you three but to go into the cabinet and help <laughs> them kind of understand uh, our area of work. Huh? Put me in there, I want to be Prime Minister. <laughs> One final thought just for the football club and the fans how important, and you've kind of said it, but I'd, I'd like you to finish off on this because I want to be positive. How important is this conversation, the, what the three of you have shared in regards to your experiences, your knowledge, your understanding, but also in regards to, you know, helping to fuel more conversation in this space. How important has today been? Massively important. I think people should be more comfortable being able to talk about a subject. I know it's quite difficult. People don't want to say the wrong thing. Um, but you should be comfortable discussing maybe your experiences and like I said, some people might be oblivious to it. Mm. They might not know racism exists. 
that's why you say you get people saying, oh, racism doesn't exist. That's because you've never experienced it. Um, but, you know, the more you go in and talk about it, you reach, in, you reach out to certain people and they think, hang on a minute, I didn't realise this was happening. Um, and I think that's, how, that's the way to go. That's the way you tap into people's minds. And um, I think if you don't speak about it, nothing's going to get done. So, yeah. Courtney? Yeah, I think it's so important to, be, to initially be given a platform to, to speak about it. And also then, as Wes said, that starts a conversation. I think it's important. I think race, money, sort of sexuality, they're sort of the taboos that no one wants to speak about. But I think as well, it's about allies. So you look to, to be an ally and to, to be anti-racist, let's say, and call it out. You don't have to be black, mixed, raced, Indian, whatever. You can be from any background. So I think as well, it's giving opportunities for people to, don't get me wrong, not be overtly racist, but they can make mistakes and say yeah. the wrong thing. Yeah. And that's fine. Like mm. if you, I think most people will know in terms of, have that gut feeling of, of how that's being said. So I think, again, opening up the channels for people to be able to make mistakes and learn from mistakes and be allies, I think for me is the, the next big step. Brilliant. And it wouldn't be right if I didn't give you the final word, would it? Yeah. So, uh, thoughts? Nice. I'm just going to be repeating, to be honest, mm. um, everything they said. So I agree with what they said. And that's it? Yeah, man. <laughs> short, short and sweet. <laughs> PM Brewster. <laughs> 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 uh, from my point of view, from the organisation point of view, obviously my title, Head of Player Engagement, means I get to work with players more. Um, I've tried to work with this guy, but yeah, it's been difficult. Um, but this is one of the processes. I've been supporting the club now for the past nine months in various different things that they're doing. I'm delivering to the women's team later on. Um, you know, I'm helping with all their EDI strategy. So that's some of the things that people don't see as well, do you know what I mean, and won't recognise. But I... I want to do more and just hearing what you're saying about you know there can be more to do but let's have a platform to do it so hopefully i can provide that platform somewhere along the line and this is just a start of many many more conversations but also filtering into the community around sheffield united to help them understand um, a little bit more although the community seems to be very good in supporting you and challenging challenge channeling get my teeth in sorry <laughs> channeling uh the kind of positive support that you all require. So thank you for joining me. Yeah, um, no. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's been brilliant.